Hello. I'm glad you're able to listen to this message. If you're not involved in a church somewhere, we'd love for you to join us some Sunday at Hope Fellowship for one of our three services. If not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area that teaches God's Word. I hope you enjoy the message. How's everyone? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Yes. I, uh, All right, I'm ready. Thank you, Lord. We're grateful for this time that you've given us together. You're good to us. Thank you for this short time that we have, that we can spend in each other's presence and just uh, uh, present ourselves to you in a special way. Lord, we, we want to tell you today that you're worth our devotion. You're worth our life. Thank you that you have uh, uh, done something to bring us to yourself. Thank you that you have uh, displayed your great power and your wisdom all around us and uh, I, I don't understand why people uh, can't see clearly that you exist and that you are worthy of seeking out and finding. Um, thank you that you've loved us in a way that uh, uh, took Jesus to this earth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for stepping into this world, for doing something that we could never do to buy us for yourself. Thank you for dying instead of us. Thank you that you rose to life by your power and uh, now wait for a time to return and we can't wait to see you, Lord. Thank you. And Spirit of God, we acknowledge your presence in us, those of us who have trusted Jesus. We, we acknowledge your presence among us today. We thank you that you're the one who's inspired truth for us to understand, that we can read it, we can think about it, we can assimilated into the way that we uh, make decisions and live our life. We, we know that your voice is the one that turns us from, from false and unholy things towards those things that are true and right. And today we, we would ask that you would teach us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there was a, there was a frontier couple, Zeb and Martha, and they were, uh, uh, you know, cutting out trees and trying to get ground ready for the crops and all that. And um, uh, Zeb, because of, because of some Native Americans that were pretty upset that they were moving into the area. And uh, he said, I'm going to install a bell on the outside of this house. And, and if you need me in emergency, life or death, you ring that bell and I'll come running. And so he moved out into the field. He's working on the field and... All of a sudden, he hears the bell ring, and he comes zipping back on his horse as fast as he can. And, uh, and he says, Martha, what's going on? She said, hey, I just, I just wondering if, uh, if, you, if you wanted uh, to fix that wash basin a little bit later on today. You know, it's got a leak in it. He, oh, he got upset. Martha, come on. I told you that that was only for emergencies. And he went back out into the field again. About a half hour later, he heard the bell ringing again. He comes zipping back. She said, I just wondering if you wanted a cup of coffee, honey. Oh, he went through the roof again. He said, Martha, please, it's only for life or death emergencies. He headed out to the field again and heard the bell ringing. He came running back to the third time as fast as he possibly can. The house is on fire. The barn's burned down. The cattle are heading out. Uh, Martha has an arrow through her shoulder, and she's slumped on the, on the side of the house. And he stands in front of her and says, now that's more like it, Martha. That's more like it, right? Now, let me ask you a question to, uh, do you have a clear understanding of what you're here for? You know, tell me, uh, you know, think with me here. Isn't there a longing in everyone's heart, I don't, know, I don't care who they are, to, to know why they're alive and to live for some, some passionate, uh, uh, to live passionately for something that they're convinced is their purpose in life? I think everyone wants to know that, you know. Uh, George Bernard Shaw one time prefaced one of his books with this. He said, uh, this is the true joy in life, 
the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap, the being a force of nature instead of a, I love the way he worded this, instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Isn't that a great line? You know, one of Rick Warren's books, way back that he wrote, screamed to number two on the New York bestsellers list, and I think it was just purely because of the title. It was called The Purpose Driven Life, and I bet some of you have read that along the way. Uh, people want to know why they're alive. They want a, a reason to get up. And um, I want to ask you this question today. Has Jesus ever captured your sense of, sense of purpose? And, and I ask that because I... I don't know if Christians uh, sometimes really have that in their life. Uh, has he become the central focus of your life? You know what, Paul talks about a lifestyle that we should be living centered on Jesus. And, and he does this in Colossians now that we're at this fourth chapter, verses 2 through 6. He's talking about a lifestyle that we should be living centered on Jesus, a, a, a lifestyle that captures him as our, as our, our central purpose. And uh, I, I love this. Let me just read through this, and then we're going to talk about it. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I'm going to say this this morning. It kind of captures where I'm going. If Jesus is the central passion, central focus of your life, two things will happen. You'll be continually in touch with him as you live your life. And the second one is that you'll be seeking to help others learn about him, whether believers or unbelievers, and you want to tell other people about him. Um, let me start with this. If you're going to make Jesus your lifestyle, number one, stay tuned to God. And what I'm, what I'm saying here, we're going to look at it here in a second, is that you need to form a habit of talking with him. Form a habit of talking with him. Sometimes people talk to God only when they're in crisis, you know. Like those two guys out in the field, and, and they're walking through the field, and they see this bull, and they realize they're in his pasture. He starts snorting and pawing the ground, and they're going, I think we're dead, and they start running. And that bull's chasing him, uh, you know, really close behind. And uh, one of them just says, Joe, it's time to pray. It's time to pray. And Joe says, I, I don't pray out loud. I, I just don't do that. He says, you got to, man. We're, it, it's it, close to the end right now. He said, okay, the only prayer I know is the one that, that we pray at supper time. He says, go ahead and pray that one. And, and he says, Lord, uh, let us be truly thankful for this which we are about to receive. And so, uh, you know. Sometimes people only talk to God when they're in a crisis. Maybe you're in, you're in that situation where you go, has it come down to this, to prayer? I've done everything that I can. I guess we have to pray now. And you know, there's three things I want to say under this. Persistence. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. That's persistence in your life. That's when, when uh, you make a decision to do something and you keep on doing it. That's what persistence is, right? You stick to it. You make it a habit and, uh, you, and, and a central focus of your life. When you understand your true purpose in life, you're going to realize that there's something going on at a level much higher than your, your routines, right? You go through the motions of every day, but before that day begins, Lifting your eyes above the routines of your life and saying, Lord, I understand that you have a higher view of things. And uh, I understand that you have a greater power. I understand all those things that are beyond me and I want to come to you, right? And so um, let me just ask this. Are you someone who continually stays in touch with God? In other words, you persist 
in your devotion to God in prayer. Uh, Jesus set an example for us. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and really we should take this as a pattern of our own life, I think, where it says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a solitary place where he prayed. That's persistence. Uh, he, he made it a, a pattern of before the day begins, before the rush of the crowds, before the sun even came up. And this would be something that would be good for all of us, I think, at some point. Sometimes you may think, ah, I'm, I'm more awake, you know, at the end of the day. But man, that's the end of the day. It's done. You've already said all your words and you've already done all your actions and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's hard uh, you know, for, for us even uh, throughout the day to uh, stay in touch with the one who is with us nonstop, who says he never leaves us or forsake us. Uh, you know, we want to stay in touch with him, but the day gets going so fast sometimes. You, know, you want to get before him before the day starts and before you get something in your mouth, before you drink something, before you... Uh, even turn a light on in the house, maybe. Find a place by yourself. Just get down on your knees and say, thank you for giving me this day. Thank you for giving me my life. Thank you for, and you can, you can lift up all kinds of things to him as you talk to him and, and then get in front of your, your Bible and maybe read a chapter or two as you read through it and let him talk to you as you talk to him. You don't need to take a half an hour. You know, some of us take longer, but you can take 10, 15 minutes, and that's it. Just before the day starts, you know. You need, you need to be free from a habit in your life. You, you can, can you pray and do that habit at the same time? Persistence in prayer. Persistence in prayer. You know, there's two things that should characterize your continual communication with God. The next two things that I want to share. Watchfulness. Watchfulness. Look at Colossians 4, 2 again. Devote yourselves to prayer, and what does he say? Being watchful. What is that? Watch. You've, if you've read through the Gospels, you're familiar with that word because, because Jesus, remember when he, after they shared the, the Passover meal together and Jesus is about ready to get arrested and taken away, uh, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and you remember what he did there? He took two of his, uh, three of his closest guys and he, he separated them, he said, watch with me and pray. Watch with me. And they did all right. They, they watched the inside of their eyelids for a little bit. And uh, Jesus went aside, and what he did is he got by himself, and he began to, if you remember, lift up his, his anguish, you know. Uh, if there's any other way, would you take this cup from me, this cup of suffering that he would go through to pay for our sin? And then he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. What was he doing? He was, looking at, he was looking at the higher purpose of his life. Why was he here? And he was in prayer talking to his father. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 37, we find this. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. It's interesting. Watch and pray. See, Jesus understood what the hour was. He understood what was going to come upon him. He understood the temptation. He understood all that because he, he had a higher view of things. And when we get, to get, it, get in the presence of God and we're watching, we begin to see that things, the, the things that are beyond us that we need to understand, that there's temptation out there, that the enemy might want to tempt you in some ways in the day that you're going to be go going into. You might be tempted to say things that you shouldn't, want, that you shouldn't say. You might be in certain situations that you'd be uh, uh, tempted to rage and anger at or, uh, or be tempted to envy or... Tempted to a lot of different things that the day might hold. You know, some of us here might not be as watchful as we need with our life. And even watchful for other people around us. Praying for their family members and others who might face things that they're not even aware of. Be watchful in prayer. 
I remember an uh, experience I had as a young adults director at my church in California. We went out to one of those uh, concerts, Christian concerts, out in the middle of nowhere kind of a thing in the uh, foothill, deserty kind of uh, place uh, where they set up these this big tent, and everyone took their tents out there, and they were camping out. And uh, I took about three guys on a on a hike in in a break in, in that concert uh, series that they were doing, and it was on a trail that was you know kind of a little desolate. And one of the guys was just totally hyped up, man. He was like running up the trails and and stuff. He's getting ready to run up this trail, and I said, man, I just want to tell you something right now. He said, I said, there's rattlesnakes that come out of these trails. They lay in the middle of the trail because they're trying to retain the heat. It's the end of the day. And, uh, and if you go running up this trail, you won't even see them in time before they strike you. Yeah, 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 yeah. One minute later, we heard a shriek. That dude just took off running up the trail. He wasn't watchful. Ah! We're like, I knew exactly what happened. I, 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 you know, I ran up, you know, looking, and, and uh, there he was. <gasps> and one of the biggest diamondbacks I've ever seen was laying in the middle of the trail all curled up. He said, he missed me by this much. I said, I tried to warn you. You see, he wasn't watchful. He wasn't concerned about it. He didn't care. He just rushed into the day, down the trail. And some of us need to be more watchful in prayer. I understand, Lord, that this world holds all kinds of temptations, all kinds of things that will distract me from you and the central purpose of my life. I want to be aware of it, and I want to lift it up to you. Thankfulness should be another thing that characterizes uh, this uh, response to God, this devotion to prayer. Look what it says in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful and thankful. I was reminded of something that that was written about uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling. It it is once said that uh, every word that he wrote was worth 25 shillings, right? And... uh, Let me read this to you. Hearing this, a group of college students got together and wrote him a letter which said, we understand every word you write is worth 25 shillings. Enclosed is 25 shillings. Send us your best word. And a couple of days later, these college students received a telegram from Mr. Kipling, and the telegram consisted of one word, thanks, right? (laughs) You know, uh, You know, thankfulness is a choice, right? I mean, sometimes we think we need to feel grateful. We need to feel grateful. Listen, when you're in prayer, you need to settle your mind on some things that you can can thank God for. It's a choice a lot of times. You know, people who are negative, they just walk through their day grumbling, complaining. Why are they negative? Because they never actively think about things they could thank someone else for or thank God for that they're grateful for it's an active reminder that you need to do you know uh, I, I remember I uh, shared with you that we had a guy by the name of Ron Hagee out to uh, the church that we had in Texas and uh, he was paralyzed from his neck down because in 18 he had a scholarship for football uh, major universities were offering scholarship and he snapped his neck uh, surfing in a wheelchair for the rest of his life just couldn't move his arms and legs, just his head. You, you, I, I guarantee you, if you've never seen it, you will never get a better perspective of being thankful than when you're looking at someone like that on a stage giving thanks for his life. And, I'm, and, and uh, uh, one of his uh, most famous lines uh, that he would share with people, he says, I can't move my arms, my feet. I have someone else feed me. I can only move my head, and I can write with my mouth. He said, and then he'd say, what's your excuse? I'm going, I'm going to be grateful for the rest of my life. I'm going to be grateful for the rest of my life. There's plenty of things that we can thank God for, plenty of things. Uh, I ate breakfast this morning. I slept in a bed last night. I'm alive today. You know, there's plenty of things we can thank God for that he has provided for us, you know. And so watchfulness and thankfulness should, be, uh, pers- uh, f- should fall on the wings of a persistent devotion to God in prayer, right? So stay tuned to God. The second thing I want to share today is stay tuned to the mission. Stay tuned to the mission. You know, uh, a man returned from a long trip that he had, and um, he, 
he was feeling ill, and he went to see his doctor, and the doctor immediately rushed him to the hospital, said, we need to take all kinds of tests on you. And uh, uh, by the time they got done taking these tests, he woke up in a room uh, by himself, and he walked over to the door to open the door, and he realized the door was locked from the outside. Heard a ring on the phone, picked it up, and it was his doctor. His doctor said, I don't know what you have, but it is really bad. And, and we have to keep you in isolation for I don't know how long. He says the, the only thing that, that we're going to do, uh, he said, is, is we're going we're gonna to put you on a special diet. Pizza, tortillas, pancakes, and pita bread. And he said, in a panic, he said, is, is that going to cure me, doctor? And the doctor said, no, but it's the only thing we can fit under the door. So... <laughs> No, what is the incurable disease that people have? What's that incurable disease? And what's the solution for it? Look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And pray for us too. Listen to his perspective. That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then he says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let me ask you a question. You're in prison, right? This is Paul. He's writing from prison. You're in prison, and you're going to write a note to people, and you're going to ask them to pray for you. What are you going to ask them for? Pray that they change their mind. Pray that they help, uh, you know, get me out of this place. You know, send someone to help, you know. That's not what he was asking. He didn't care whether or not he got out of the jail. He realized he was around all kinds of people who never got the proper perspective of life. What's he asking God for? And, and then what did he ask? What did he say that... Uh, he wanted to encourage other people to do. You, you know, there's a, a guy by the name of Ron Hutchcraft years ago, uh, heavily involved in youth ministry and teaching and training in that area. And he, he said there's, there's four reasons why people don't share Jesus with other people. The first one is this. 90% have failed in, in a, the, an attempt in the past. Like, man, I can't. I just totally blew that, Right? Tried to do it, and you failed at it in, in their own personal feelings. Number two, they're biblically, biblically illiterate. In other words, I don't know enough about the Bible to say anything to somebody else. right? Number three, they leave it up to the professionals. Hey, they could do a better job than me. right? And number four, you know, we shouldn't impose our faith on somebody else. Sometimes people think that way. They shouldn't impose their faith on somebody else. And... Uh, I, I want to ask you this. Have you ever noticed that people become missionaries for whatever they're excited about? You ever notice that? You get a new brand of soap that's really cheap, scrapes your skin really good, and it smells good. You're in a conversation with somebody. Hey, what brand was that? Man, there's a great, there's a great uh, 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 sale over there at Walmart. Man, you can get this stuff. It's great. All of a sudden, you're a missionary. Or, or you talk about the car you just bought, or you talk about something else, the, the uh, bed get that, that you have. Man, I, I, I tell you what, you ought to do this. And man, you're a missionary. You're teaching them, uh, you're, you're helping someone uh, get connected with something that they might need, you know? And you're excited about it, right? You know, let me ask you this. Are you really convinced deep down that Jesus is what people need? See, that's what, that's what holds back most of us from talking about him. We're really not that convinced, right? Our parents might have been convinced because they dragged us to church. If you grew up in a home like that, many of us have and some of us haven't. And, and, and they were excited about it. And so maybe all you experienced was religion. You just got dragged to church. Well, I got to do this. It's Sunday, right? We'll bring the kids you know, because they need it too. And we'll endure the hour and a half. And then we'll go home and we'll feel good about it. But you're not excited about Jesus. Right? Uh, 
or, or, or what people really need, is it a good education? Is it more money? Is that what they need? Uh, do people really need a good wife, a good husband, a great relationship with somebody else, some good friends? Is that what they really need? You know? I mean, sometimes we're not really that convinced people need Jesus. You know? Uh, you know, the problem is, is that maybe deep down inside, we're not that excited about it. He hasn't really touched the depths of our, of our soul. It might have happened a while ago. But it's not an ongoing thing for us. It's not a, something we remember every day as we talk to God. Thank you for what you've provided for me. My life would have been empty without you. And you saved me. You forgave me. You put me on a new path. You see, when someone's spending time with God, remembering what it was like remembering how he gave you life, a new start, made you born again, excited you about living, gave you a sense of purpose, a new message. You keep that alive by your devotion to him. You're excited to tell other people about him. You look for those opportunities. You know? Uh, you know, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, just to remind you who've been around for a while to, of something that, that, from God's perspective, is the problem with humanity. Not just his people. What did he say? He said, my people have committed two sins. And what are the sins that, that they've committed? Number one, they've forsaken me, the spring of living water. See, that's the problem with humanity. They've turned their back on an oasis in the middle of a desert. They need water to live. But they said, I'm not going to the oasis. I don't need that. I don't need you, God, as the source of life, the one who can give me everything that I need for eternity, the one who can connect me with true life in a relationship with yourself. I don't need that. See, that's sin number one. Everyone's committed that sin. They've said, I don't need you, God. I'll live life on my own without you. And sin number two, what is sin number two? Forsaken ye, me, the spring of living water, and they have dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold water. They have to do that when they turn their back on an oasis. They have to start digging holes in the ground. They, they have to look around them to supply the needs that they have on their own. And so they start digging holes in the ground, a cistern that might catch the runoff. But God says there's cracks in those holes. And so they dig a hole, they dig a hole, they dig a hole, they dig a hole, because they're not going to have anything to do with that oasis over there that comes up out of the ground freely. No, 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 no. I don't need you to give me life, Lord. I'll look for it on my own. See, that's the essence of sin. You know, and I remind you, you've got all those lists in the Bible of this is a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin. Well, all those things are just you saying, I'll dig a hole, and I'll try to find life on my own. And I'll do it however I feel like without you, Lord. See, that's all it is. There's a problem with humanity. We have been separated from God. There's three huge needs that we go looking for in this life, and I'm going to remind you of these again. What we need is security. Everyone's looking for it. We're born into this world with a need to know everything's going to be okay. And what people do is they start looking around them to give them things that will make them feel secure. I got a good job. I got a good uh, uh, wife or a good husband. Uh, I, got a, I got a good uh, source of income. I, got, I have uh, stuff that I've stored up. I got a good bank account. I, I'm set. And so they look around in this world for what security is, but that's not the true need. We need to be secure forever. That's the true security that people need. And the second need that people look around for is a sense of significance. They want to be somebody. They do that through various avenues. If I please them enough, they're going to recognize that I have some special talents. You know, if I do my job well enough, they're going to recognize that I'm really climbing the ladder. I'm doing really good. I'm killing it at work. Whatever it might be, or I got this talent, I got this education. Yeah, you're the guy. You're the girl. And we look for those things in this world, but we don't turn to God, who really says, you're my child. Man, I just, 
made you born again. I took you out of this world and I took you unto myself and I united you with myself and you're going to be with me forever. You're significant to me, child. They don't look for it in a relationship with God. Or how about the third need that I mentioned is a sense of belonging. You want to really connect with somebody at the soul level. We want to be wanted, don't we? Everyone wants to be wanted. We want someone to look in our eyes and say, I want you. Man, that thrills us to the core. Ooh, they want me. You know, we hate rejection. And we look around in this world for that in relationships with other people. And sometimes we look at other people as the source for all three of those things. Are you going to make me feel secure? Are you going to make me feel special and significant? Are you going to want me more than anything else? And you know what? When just one of those things aren't met in a relationship, we want to get out of it. See, we have those deep needs, but we don't go to God for them. See, the entire world has been separated from a personal relationship and eternal relationship with the living God because of sin. They've turned their back on the living God and said, I'll find my needs met in this world. That's where they are. And if you came into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who paid for your sin and said, there's going to be no more separation if you don't want it, because I have, been, I have paid the entire price for your sin. The wrath of the Father was poured out on me for the, the penalty of what you've done. You don't have to carry the shame of it anymore. You don't have to carry the guilt of it anymore. I've paid for it. If you trust me, you'll live. If you trust me, you'll live. You know, as a missionary, Jesus viewed life in a certain way, didn't he? You're thinking, Jesus was a missionary? Of course he was. He stepped out of heaven and entered a foreign world to him. He added a human nature to his divine nature. He became a man. And he walked among us, sinful humans. It's a foreign mission field. He's holy, separate from us. And he entered our world. And how did he view humans when he walked among us? Look at in, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know what he saw? He saw a bunch of people who were trying to find their needs met on their own without turning to the true and living God saying, I need you. And in a world where they're trying to meet their own needs is a hostile place. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. When he looked upon humanity, he saw people with gaping needs in their life. The need for a personal relationship with him, the chief shepherd. And they're just flea-ridden, mangy people walking around trying to grab life out of this world. See, that's what it, how he saw us. And he says, there's not enough people with the same mindset. That's what he was saying. We need to be tuned into the mission of Jesus. In Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Therefore, go and make disciples. There's a mission, a purpose for our lives. There's people around us along life's way that are going to need to hear this message. Make followers of them. Help them. Right? And so what Paul is saying here in Colossians is no different than what Jesus said. Look at verse 3 again. And pray for us too that God may get us out of this God-forsaken prison. That's not what he said. He said that he might open a door for our message. I'm here among a bunch of guards who are pagans. They're worshiping false gods. They don't know where to turn. And I just want an opportunity to be able to share with them about how they can live. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then he turns his attention to us, to the Colossians, to us. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, those that don't know God. Make the most of every opportunity. 
Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We need to be tuned into the mission. There's a reason for our life. Not just to wander through grabbing stuff out of this world like everyone else does, trying to satisfy themselves and fill their needs up without God. So, under this point, pray for opportunity. Pray for opportunity as we tune into the mission. Look at verse 3. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message. God opens the strangest doors sometimes, doesn't he? And you know what? If you're not watchful, I'm just going to throw this out there. You're looking at those open doors in a rear view mirror. Aren't you? You're turning around going, I can't believe I missed that. You know why? Because you weren't tuned into the mission. You weren't being watchful. Uh, you know, he opens the strangest doors. I remember uh, just for an example in my life, I was, I was uh, uh, doing a little outdoor uh, uh, ski touring with uh, Greg James. He was teaching me how to do it. And we were up uh, uh, near ne Natchez uh, Point or whatever it's called up there. And someone comes down the road and they stopped the car and they, and they leaned out the window uh, and they said, hey, can you guys tell us the way to paradise? <laughs> See, you're laughing now, but we said, man, I, I don't, we don't know exactly know which, which direction that goes. And they were driving away and go, oh, crap. I could have told them. What a softball just tossed into our lap. The way to paradise? I missed it in my rearview mirror, Right? Greg James later on said he was up there and someone asked him the same question, stopped the car, and he said, I was ready. <laughs> it, was a, it was a miracle that that would happen twice in a lifetime. And he said, I was ready, I told him. And, uh, you know, I remember a friend of mine, Tom Lynn, he's since passed, but he was someone who was always tuned into the message. He had a, a, a foreign exchange student from China in their house for a whole year. And evidently this, this kid came from a very wealthy family in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, after the, the student went back, uh, Tom says the family invited us to go to Hong Kong to spend a week there. All expenses paid, and they would uh, get toured around uh, all the, the, the sites and all that, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Tom's a businessman. He owned his own business. He's thinking to himself, uh, you know, I don't know if we'd take that kind of time. But, but he, uh, he said, absolutely. Why? Because he's tuned into the mission all the time. My friend Tom was. He's going, what an opportunity to be in the middle of a family and all of their extended family for a week. And sure enough, man, he told me all kinds of stories and conversations that they had about what? The most important thing in life. Because he's tuned into the mission, not just here doing his job, but opportunities, doors that God might open. Pray for clear communication, the next sub point. Pray for clear communication. Look at verse 4. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Would you know how to do that if you're a believer here today? You probably would be able to have a conversation with somebody. Pretty simply, God loves you, has a plan for your life. You know why we're not in tune with that? Because we're, we've fallen short of his standards. We're, we're sinful people. We're separated from him. And, but you know what? Number three, God has done for us. He's provided a solution for our sin. He stepped out of heaven because he loved us so much. And, and, and the Father punished him instead of us for our sin. He traded places with us because he loved us so much. And fourth, you need to trust Jesus personally. You need to tell him, I want you to forgive me for my sin, and I trust what you did to pay for my sin, and I know that you're alive because he was raised to life from the dead. You could do that. You might not all know all the verses that surround it, but you know what? Sometimes people don't need to hear all of the perfectly quoted verses when you're doing that. They just need to hear the story. And if they want, want some follow-up, you can certainly do that with them. So pray for clear co communication. That's what Paul said. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Clearly. The next sub-point here is let your life... Be attractive to people. Let your life be attractive to people. Let me ask you this. Are there habits in your life that need to change that other people can observe? 
Look at Colossians 4, 5. Be wise in the way you act towards outside. What's your behavior like when you're around people? Make the most of every opportunity. In other words, buy up the time. Make sure you're using it wisely. Make sure that your presentation to them in their, in their midst, that you're living out the message in front of them. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you're a chosen people. Speaking of believers in Jesus, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. In other words, that's who you are. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Spirit of God came into you, changed you, took you out of this world, made you His very own possession, changed you on the inside. This is who you are. That will never change for all of eternity. This is who you are. And what he's saying is, live that out in front of other people. That you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Look at a few verses later in verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans, those people that worship any other thing than the true living God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, and there's plenty of opportunity for for people who accuse us, especially in this day and age, of doing wrong because they believe that wrong is right and right is wrong. Around us, they do. They believe that wrong things are right and that right things are wrong right now. And so it's easy for them to accuse us of being haters and people that don't think the right way about how we should approve of other people and uh, actions of other people. Uh, they shouldn't be living with other people, who they ad how they identify, all those kind of things. They think uh, wrong is right and right is wrong and they accuse us. They accuse us of doing wrong. Even though they might do that, that they might see your good deeds, that's something they can't deny. How you behave. How your lifestyle is. They can never deny that. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. It makes them think they're different than other people. They're kind. Uh, they do things, uh, they treat other people uh, with respect and honor in different ways. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you're the light of the world. Again, that's who you are. That's who I am. We're the light of the world. Jesus is ultimately the light, but as his children, we're the ones that illuminate the truth. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people hide a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, your light should shine before men. And how does your light shine before men? That they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. How do you behave? What do you do in this current world that sets you apart as someone who's different? How are you living out who you are? I'll read this to you. This was in a um, publication called Our Daily Bread, if you've ever heard of that or read anything in it. Uh, according to the book of life of Francis de Assisi, Francis once lived a, invited a young monk to join him on a trip to town to preach. Honored to be given the invitation, the monk readily accepted. All day long, he and Francis walked through the streets, byways, alleys, and even into the suburbs. They rubbed shoulders with hundreds of people. At day's end, the two headed back home. Not even once had Francis addressed a crowd, nor had he talked to anyone about the gospel. Greatly disappointed, his young companion said, I thought we were going into town to preach. Francis responded, My son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We were seen by many, and our behavior was closely watched. It's no use to walk anywhere to preach, unless we preach everywhere we walk. Now, they were monks. They were obviously representing Jesus because of their garb. And so when people saw them, they instantly associated them with whatever message uh, came along with it. And so they were observing their lifestyle. Francis of Assisi said this once. He said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Okay? What was he referring to? Same thing here. People are looking at your life, and that... If they may know that you go to church, you may have said something about Jesus at some point uh, where they go, I think that person's a Christian. But you know what? They're putting two and two together when they're watching how you behave. 
And as they watch how you behave, they're associating it with things that you might have said, maybe not clearly about Jesus, but things that you have said, and they're associating you with whatever Jesus might represent. Next one here is let your speech be attractive. Look, look at verse 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Let me pause there for a moment. Full of grace. Our conversation full of grace. You know what that means? That means that people are attracted to you. And they would think, because of your speech, I'd like to be around that person. I don't know, something about your speech, your kindness, the grace by which you speak is something that comforts them, attracts them, and says, I bet they're a good person to be around, a, a good friend. I bet they'd be a good friend, a forgiving person, a merciful person. Uh, I just want to make a comment about people who like to spout off publicly about their political views and all that kind of stuff, just to remind you again. When people have this knife edge to their communication about issues and those kind of things, they don't want to be around us. I just want to tell you that. They don't want to be around us. In fact, they say that's those people. Okay? You might want to double think sometimes how you're coming across to people and what you're saying about things, what you're posting publicly, those kind of things. Because it does not come across like this. Full of grace. It comes across like full of anger. Full of viciousness. Right? I'm not expecting people to nod their heads right now. But this is extremely important when it comes to reaching people and understanding the higher mission. The higher mission is not getting the right president into office. Okay. And I don't care what conspiracy theories people buy into, they take note of those. They're those people, you see. They're those people. Seasoned with salt. Look at that, seasoned with salt. So that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you're the salt of the earth. Again, who you are. That's who you are. You can't change that if you're a believer in Jesus. That's who he made you. You're salt. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for any, anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. What is he saying about salt here? Salt is an influencer. That's what salt is by nature. You put it on food because you want it to influence the taste. That's why salt is put on things. It, you, want, you put it in uh, meat that you want to preserve because it influences the meat. Uh, you know, you might put it on, on the ground, uh, uh, on the ice, because it influences its environment in such a way that the water melts, right? It's an influencer. And you know what? That's what we are. We need to be influencing people the right way, influencing them. You know, what takes away your personal ability to influence let me ask you that. What takes away my personal ability to influence somebody in a positive way for Christ? Well, it might be an unholy life and an unwillingness to speak. That takes away my ability to influence. I'm not going to open my mouth about Jesus or you know what? I don't care how I live in front of them. It takes away your ability to influence another person. And that's exactly the same thing that takes away a church's inability to influence somebody else. Some, some churches just function as organizations. They don't care about the holiness of the people uh, who attend, the, the progressive uh, uh, change in people's lives, the understanding that, that God hates certain things and wants to encourage uh, a change in behavior in, in people's lives. And many churches uh, may not care about the right message that's being spoken either. I remember a guy down the hall in my dormitory, uh, and this is one of the probably, I, I, you know, probably the only time I can actually remember someone doing this. He said, I've been watching you. 
And he says, I, I want you to explain to me what Christianity is all about. That was powerful to me. That made me just get on my knees and say, thank you, Lord. I don't know what he's seeing in my life, you know. But, but uh, uh, you know, and I had a wonderful conversation with him. On the other hand, there was another guy who lived right across the hall from him who, uh, who, who uh, stopped me one time as I was walking by, and I, I, we, we knew each other. And he said, hey, come on in here. And he came in, and he was all pumped up to debate me on some, some Jesus stuff, you know. And so, you know, he... He, he started down this trail, and, and I was trying to do my best to respond to him. And, and by the time I got done, I just walked back to my room. Uh, you know, it was a friendly conversation. But when, I, when I got back to my room, I just thought to myself, I botched that whole thing up. I shouldn't have said things like that. I shouldn't have done this, that, or the other thing. And I, I remember just uh, thinking through that thing a week, and then every time I see him, I think again, you know, months later, uh, I wish I could revisit that conversation. And then someone came up to me and said, uh, hey, did you hear about what happened to so-and-so? I said, no. So he pulled in front of the, one of the monuments uh, on campus, and he had an ACDC tape playing in his cassette player, and, and he routed the exhaust from his uh, car and put it in his window. Took his life. I tell you, man, I'm thinking, I botched that conversation. But you know what? thankfulness came to me because I said something I was probably the only person that had he had had a conversation like that with I'm thinking you know he's 18 or so he never thought through these things before he got to the college and probably my conversation with him was one of the most significant ones he's ever had about Jesus even though I botched it I said something you know what I'm saying and you could probably think, if you're a believer, of, of sometimes that might have happened to you as well. You said something. Something to help someone find life out of your desire, you know, to understanding that he's my purpose, my reason for living. It doesn't matter if you do it perfectly. Let me close with this today. I, I, I thought of this. I actually contacted Tom Gaines. You know, he was a deacon here for a while, a wonderful, wonderful influence on our church and many of you knew him and he found a great ministry where he's at now but uh he came to taiwan with us three years in a row and led the trip last year and uh he showed us a post that one of the students had posted because uh you know he would hang the student would hang out with us he'd never heard really anything about jesus before he would hang out with us and just spend time with the group with tom because tom especially reached out to him and, and a couple other guys and uh and, and we'd come back the next year and then the next year, right? Um, and here's the note that he wrote to Tom the third time uh, that we came back. He said this. He said, sometimes I think destiny is true. Now, this, this guy is not a believer in Jesus, really. It's already changed my life after meeting you guys every single year. Even though we meet once a year, but we're not like friends who haven't seen each other for a long time. There's no sense of alienation. Every time when I get lost, you appear. It feels like someone wants to help me, bring me to the right path. And, and let me recognize that there are some people, in languages, I think he's saying, who care very much about people and kindness. He's talking about the group, especially Tom. He says they love their wife or husband very much. They don't care about being rich. Just want family peace and happiness. Let me step back for a minute. That's what he was observing. See? He was seeing that. And combining that with the message, he understood where that came from. See? And then he said, I truly love you guys, and thanks for sharing your awesome story. Hopefully we can meet in America. There's someone in process, in process. Because lives were shared with him and observed, and the story was shared as well. And uh, that could be us. You know, uh, uh, is Jesus your lifestyle? Jesus your lifestyle? I want him to be mine, you know. And I think he wants everyone's, uh, every believer to have Jesus as our lifestyle. And so, Lord, we come to you.
we're grateful that we can actually know you personally. Thank you that you've allowed us and provided for us to have a relationship with you through Jesus. Thank you for paying for our sin. Rising from the dead so that we could have life. I ask for each one of us here that we would continue to find our life in you, that we would spend time with you and, and uh, that we would be watchful, that we would be thankful and that we would, we would always have before us the mission, the higher reason for our life as we walk through this, this world. We want to see this world through your eyes, Lord. And I, I pray for anyone here who, uh, who is a believer, who loves you with all their heart, that they would continue to, to set you before them daily and, and find that joy that they do now in their relationship with you and that they would continue to have before them the desire to uh, look for those opportunities that you're providing and open doors. I pray for any believer here today who... Uh, lis or listening today who's uh, who's wandered down a path that they shouldn't. They're involved in something that is keeping them from putting you in front of them as their their sole source of life. I ask that they would uh, come to that place where they would confess that and draw near to you. I pray for anyone who doesn't know you yet. They've never trusted Jesus to forgive them. They've never entered a relationship with, with him. And they don't have life. I ask that you would do a work in their heart that would open them up and draw them in such a powerful way that they couldn't imagine walking through life one more step without you. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for a moment and your eyes closed just for a, a minute or two of prayer as you, in your heart as you spend a moment reflecting and talking to God. If you know Him and love Him, it might be a great time to tell Him what you're thankful for. If you're someone who has wandered down a path as a believer that you shouldn't be on right now, that you've something going on in your life that you know isn't right, between you and God. It might be a good time to have a conversation with him about that. Confess it to him. Tell him you want to you want to make things right. Maybe you don't know him yet and you're thinking I need to. I want to find my life in him. I have a prayer that you might you might want to consider praying as you think I don't know what to say. I'm going to pray something out loud, and if you want to, in your heart, repeat these words, that's perfectly okay if you agree with them. Lord Jesus, I need you. I've done a lot of things that you hate. I've been living life without you. And I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I trust what you did to pay for my sin. And I know you're alive. Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus, amen.